normal distribution, right. then presumably there will be as many children who are above average as there are below average. You know, that kind of follows from nature. So that being the case, why is it that we always hear about disadvantaged children and at least for me, I almost never hear about advantaged children. And what are we doing for them? The ones who are way above the normal. In fact, though, if you do research and just an FYI, my schools are, I don't know if you have Title I in India or if you know what Title I schools are. No. They're, they're actually very disadvantaged. They come from high poverty. It means they're on free and reduced lunch because their families are below income. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm getting to two points. And I actually work at bilingual schools. So some of those kids are coming from Spanish speaking homes. Mm -hmm. And I just love that aspect. So there's two points of what you're saying. If you do look at the research, and I do, there, are, there has been articles put out that state, and I, I work with student teachers too. So I teach college and the elementary gifted, which is a lovely balance mm -hmm. um, that we're leaving the, the, advanced, the smarter kids behind. So schools tend to focus on the remedial kids, as you probably yeah. know. Yeah. In our school, especially since they're Title I, they're always pulling out the kids that need reading. And I know you want to get to that, too. Reading and math instruction, more language arts. And I'm like, in the regular classrooms, I see the kids. I, ha I work at two schools, and I have several groups, younger kids and older kids. And I see the kids average two to six hours a week. And they're so bored in their regular classroom because the teachers are focusing on the low end. And I think we leave the smarter, the kids with more ability, I don't even call them smarter kids, more ability behind. Because what some of the research has shown about fifth grade, they start leveling out and getting the same grades and tests and stuff as the other kids because no one, just because they're talented doesn't mean they still need, they still need the challenges. And they're just sitting there getting bored in classes and the poor things. That's why I love teaching, especially kids from these lower income, because um, my supervisor does an excellent job trying to identify kids because kids in poorer schools don't get identified as high ability either hmm. because teachers think if they do good on tests, they have higher ability and that's not necessarily the case. And I think we feel the same about tests. That's one reason I do gifted. I think they're ridiculous and they don't show us hmm. anything. That's the thing. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, this whole idea, well, two ideas really. One is that if you think about what the system is trying to do, it's trying to bring everybody to an average. If you're below, then they pull you up and everybody loves it because that's very nice. Yeah. But if you're above, they pull you down and that nobody talks about. No, they don't even say anything because they're like, oh, okay. At least they're performing and the kid the kids who are who are no trouble academically, they make the teachers look good because they do fine on tests and nobody's asking them to show their ability on these mm. tests. It's just, oh good, we got we got them to test at a fourth grade level where in their, when they're in fourth grade. Yay, mm. let's give ourselves a hand. And mm -hmm. then they don't say, wow, this kid's um, performing eighth grade math in fourth grade. Let's give them a hand. It just doesn't happen. And it's heartbreaking. I know. So that kind of brings me to uh, my next question, which is how do you identify who these uh, higher ability learners are? H how do you check that? So, like I said, my supervisor's really good. There's a, but it's still testing and it still bothers me. 
It's called the COGAT, and it's it's meant to test kids on high ability. Luckily, it has um, three sections, verbal, math, and then pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. And luckily, then a, a kid just needs to perform high in one of those three areas rather than because rarely do you get kids who could perform high ability naturally. But what's also exciting, and I've really pushed for this, Jeffrey, like I said, we test, but like I test them, but he's actually reduced the percentage and he's been doing local norms, which is help. Because Santa Fe, New Mexico has incredibly wealthy schools where you walk in and parent involvement and you think you were in a private school to my schools, which they used to grade schools. I'm so happy they stopped. They stopped about three years ago. We were getting D's because of the kids test scores. Mm -hmm. But um, now he's starting again using local norms and now we're identifying more kids. So he's grouping schools with like demographics. Mm -hmm. and then pulling the top five percent and then we're also now using which i love is teacher observations and parent mm -hmm. observations. oh okay fantastic and so once you've identified a group do you separate them do you take them out into another class or, or something like that yeah i do we all do we have a pull out which is my preference. As I mentioned earlier, I hate tests. I was a PE teacher for a while, and then now mm -hmm. I went to gifted. I refuse to give kids standardized tests. I think they verge on child abuse to make kids sit there hour. At, at, I know. An <laughs> eight-year-old? <laughs> Well, what can I say? I mean, you and I, we, we've both been through that ourselves, haven't we? So <laughs> I remember that. And I know, I remember taking it, I found out later, an IQ test, and I was sitting next to someone, and we're going, nobody was paying attention. What did you put for A? <laughs> we were <getting> yeah, <laughs> that's right. I know. And I to know. use a single test to assess someone. No, and so I, we do rich description, which I like. So we each quarter, we have to do a progress report. And I love, I and this is, I hope we get, discuss it some more i just show kids things to do and they take off hmm. and so their yeah, assessment this coming quarter are is a creativity and we're supposed to do it about the kids but i just let them do it i say pick one project we did this year here's the rubric write me up a little thing and this is what goes in your progress report i like you i think we devalue the system devalues the capabilities of kids yeah well that's absolutely uh, but uh, you know the one of the reasons that your uh, post actually caught my eye was because just before that coincidentally i had uh, uh, you know given an interview to a newspaper in england saying that uh, why don't we allow children to use the internet during an exam during a test i mean well, what's yeah, the problem I because that's how you feel but... yeah yeah well so anyway so a lot of people were discussing this and so on and a journalist uh kind of did a very good interview but she asked me a question and i uh stumbled on that the question was she said look i can understand your self-organized methods that you allow the children to do you know you give them a question you let them use the internet let them use whatever they want and work it all out. My question is, at what age can you start that? You know, and I, the more I thought about it, I said, well, this, this is a, this is an interesting question. I mean, I can't do that with one year olds because, you know, I mean, how would I, uh, just around this time, I saw your post and I said, gosh, she's talking about really young children. So, how are they doing it? How are they actually reading this stuff? And then to my amazement, you sent that reply, which is said that they use Google. Uh, they use Google Talk. They use, and you know, I just hadn't thought of that. I said, gosh, so this is, this is kind of a, a step uh, beyond Google search. Right. Th this is using Google to, to talk, you know. And 
that and another incident which I remember is of a two-year-old who had access to her mother's uh, uh, you know, iPad when her mother was not there. And I was there <laughs> and she was downloading games. So I said to her, hey, listen, be careful. This is going to cost your mom money. And she said, no, it's free. So I said, how, how do you know it's free? And she pointed to the box where the payment thing is. And she says, if there are no squiggles in it, it means it's for free. And I thought to myself, God, so, so is she reading or is she not? Because in a way, she is reading. I mean, she's doing the right thing. Pattern recognition. Yeah, that, that's what. She just knows the shape of free. She doesn't know what it means, but she knows if it's not there, then it means it's not free. And if it's there, then it means it's free. So so I started to question this whole whole idea of how much or how much do they need to know? I'm not putting this very, very clearly. I mean, how, how at what level can you say to a group of children, okay, go ahead, do it yourself? How young? You know, and you're saying we could even try at pre-reading because they're not going to do the kind of search that you and I do. They're going to do the kind of search which illiterate people do. You, you know, uh, th this might come as a, as a bit of a surprise to you, but in India, grown-up illiterates do Google searches using voice. They just ask, you know. And uh, so then I thought, oh, gosh, so, so this is actually a method that is in use. It's just kind of crept up on us because we never, ever thought that there would be a machine to which you can talk, you know, and, and which would answer. This, is, this was not even there in our old science fiction books. Right, <laughs> so, right. yeah. yeah. So, 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 uh, so you've... You've watched children doing that. Uh, so if you had to, I mean, this is an unfair question, but if you had to put in a nutshell that at what age do you think we could start? You know? I, I actually have no idea, but I think you're saying, I don't think we know, like with a two-year-old, they're growing up with devices and parents aren't limiting screen time anymore. And we have little kids getting on Minecraft and Fortnite even, even though that's an older game. And they're figuring it out at a very young age. They go to YouTube, you know that, when they need. So they're doing, they're doing their own self-determined or self-organized learning. Um, just an FYI, I was thinking about that when I knew you were talking. I know this is a little aside, but during the pandemic, um, obviously we were meeting virtually and I let the kids have a gaming club once a week where mm -hmm. they could pick the video game. So they're all in their own homes and they would play, but have Google meet open. And I would listen to their conversations and it was fascinating how they helped each other. And you know that. And I think mm -hmm. little kids are starting just like on the playground. If you see two kids even as young as four or five and they struggling, the one kid might show the other kid. That's what kids are doing now. So I think at a very, obviously pre four or three, they're just, they don't interact with other kids. So you wouldn't have, they do parallel play. But I mm -hmm. think combination of being on devices, you know, parents shoving it in their kids' hands, to entertain them at 18 months and kids learning just naturally helping each other. I don't, I think we don't even know how young they could go. I think yeah. teachers limit, and you know that I, I, I listened to your, I was saying if you had a more recent, the pandemic and teachers still, they're using more technology, but they still aren't letting their kids go to town and self-direct which really bothers me because they know the kids could do it but they're still stuck in the traditional mm. mode of teaching so i know that's a little off for your answer but i think between being with their peers and being on devices at such a young age i don't think we know yet 
Our, yeah, well, that, that's very valuable, what, what you said, that, I mean, we, we may not know the answer, but we know that whatever that age is, it's actually very low. It's much lower than we would have normally thought. Uh, when well, I started this, you know, when I started this 20 years ago, oh, you did. Uh, people would make a guess and they would say, we think eight years. And even I used to go around saying, well, I think you should start at about eight years. Then 10 years passed. And then the same people started saying, maybe you can try at five. And I went around town saying, yeah, you can start it from five. Then it's come to now, where there's an unspoken kind of assumption. As soon as they can read a little bit, it's right. okay. But I think what you're getting at, and you're a practitioner, is that that need not be the criterion. No, like I was amazed I have, and he's exceptional. I have a first grader who I just, he's so, and so that's six, right? He just goes and I just, he finishes the project so fast. So I said, here's a scratch video, make your own video game. And he does. I showed him another site, Make Code Arcade, and he's making video games and they have mm -hmm. tutorials, but I don't have, I just gave him the web link. That girl who couldn't even read last year, she's a young um, second grader. So she's probably still seven to figure out that she could go look up facts about birds, which I didn't tell her to do. She made a bird character. She looked up her own facts. She used several websites and then she recorded the facts and they were pretty advanced. And this is a kid who couldn't even recognize words at the end of last year. So these are six and seven year olds who are very, I know they're gifted, but they're still kids development. I know, I know. You know what it kind of points to, I'm beginning to think that this sort of access that you're giving them and you're giving to really young children might actually help them to start reading a lot faster than otherwise. You know, they, because they, they just need to read. So they start yeah, reading interest driven so the other k i have like i said i have another school who i just got five new and they're boys and they're second graders so they're young so what they're seven at the most and they're bilingual so their parents speak spanish at home so they're they don't speak english except at school and I gave them robotics because they're boys and I knew they'd be interest driven. And I have little Kindles and iPads and there's tutorials on what to do. And they're sitting there and I'm just blown away. I'm just, cause my supervisor is very traditional and he thinks they need to be doing paper reading and all this. He said, how, they, how are you gonna build their English language skills? And I sent them pictures of these little boys. They were several line to, directions for each tutorial and they were reading them and if they didn't understand it they called me over but more more often than not they were reading these directions yeah, and programming and, and can, the robot and and can you imagine that in a few years time there will be somebody trying to teach these kids about verbs and adjectives and prepositions and, and grammar I, I mean it's so mind no context i've always argued with that teaching that's why so many i asked my student teachers last night how many of you hate math and half of them raise it i said because you had no context or reference for it so teaching like you're saying reading grammar how horrible to teach grammar with no context it makes no sense whatsoever. absolutely absolutely makes no sense at all so anyway i mean i i think um, we have both kind of saying the same thing and something quite interesting to say that self-organizing systems, particularly given the kind of technology the internet right now has, will actually produce results that even people like you and me don't expect. It's going to be unheard of. That's what I said. I, I was saying, I love the 21st century. I wish it came sooner because I just love it. <laughs> it's, but uh, it's, it's, absolutely, it's absolutely amazing. And what it really shows is that when we say 
improving education. Uh, we've, we've got it a bit wrong there. It's not a question of improving education. We've got something new coming, something that doesn't even have a name yet, you know, and it will replace education. It needs to. That's why I, uh, I became a teacher because I found it to be a horrible, abusive system. I thought sitting there hours when I was starting young, second, third grade through high school, I'm like, this is horrible. I'm smart. I'm bored. And then when the internet, I say the internet has been the universe's gift to me. I know it's not to me. Mm. But because <laughs> I, I'm on looking up things. I hear something. I, I knew we were going to talk. I'm like, does he have a more current? And you talked about a pandemic. You had a talk on Zoom about the pandemic learning. How neat that we could just go and and look up things. And that's what the kids do. And to be, and to be limited in school. Luckily, our district likes technology and all our kids have Chromebooks that they take home. And they get, they're on it a lot. But again... Sometimes I call it worksheets on steroids. Sometimes they just give them internet doing the same thing they did with paper and pencil, which is ridiculous use. Yeah, that doesn't make much sense. And the other thing which I keep saying to people is uh, that is what you obviously do, which is that one child alone with the internet is not a very good idea. Right. They should be together. You need that group. And the other thing that bugs me is that we need bigger screens. Yeah, you know, I heard you if, say if that. We had, yeah, if you had big screens, then you don't need to go peering over their shoulders. You can sit at the back of the classroom and you can keep track of what's going on on every screen. And they would find it easier to huddle around the computer, you know, three, four, five of them, instead of trying to peer at one little screen. Yeah, it's funny. I give my older kids challenges. Like we do wordles and I put it on the big screen and they're, they yeah. all huddle. And we also do like, because I like logic puzzles, you know, squares and there's tons of squares and they have to figure out how many squares mm -hmm. they are. It's so cute the way they all, they start in the seats and then they're all start getting closer mm -hmm. and closer and they, they talk it out. I have been using technology probably probably close to a couple decades now. And I love, mm. and I never stop loving how kids doing like a similar thing on their Chromebooks will mm. help each other out and say, point over there and say, have you looked at this? And it's so cute to watch yes. them being on the internet, but then giving each other hints side by that's side. The, that, that, that's the thing, you know, and the, and what frustrates me is that teachers who haven't tried this will, without even trying, say that, oh, no, that's that's too much. We, we, we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't do that. And I keep saying, well, just try it once, you know, just give the kids, give 10 children one computer with a big screen with the internet on it and just watch. That's all you need to do. You know, just oh, watch. it's just, that's why I feel so lucky to teach these kids. And because I teach gifted, no one tells me what to do. So I get right. the projects <laughs> I want, but it's, I talk about, I've been saying this for years that teachers are the tour guide of learning possibilities. You show them the possibilities and get out of the way, just get out yeah. of the way. They, and. And I let go of what their products should look like, too. Mm -hmm. I don't have an image. I say, like, now my one class is building sustainable paper cities. And they'll look up facts online, and then they build. And that was my only thing. Here's some materials. And go for it. And, and to and watch it's, them, yeah. it's just, I've always, I, I feel privileged that I get to see kids learning and figure things out. And I'm like, Try to tell teachers step back and just watch. Yeah, it's a, absolutely a it's a miracle to watch how they learn. I just get so excited about. Well, you know, another thing that uh, sort of comes to my mind is what would happen if you took a couple of children from the other section, the the so called yeah. regular, yeah. Well, and put them into the yours. I, the teachers, I'm not allowed to do that just because of, oh, okay. of the school, but they would do fine. 
In fact, that's what I figure that we know that all kids have talents. And I even heard at one of my student teachers say she grouped them and put a couple boys who weren't really good at writing. They were writing a story, mm -hmm. but the boys started illustrating and looking things online. So not everyone, and you know this, not everyone, and that's the problem with elementary school. Not everyone's going to be great at math. We're not in real life. And not everyone's going to be a yeah, great that's a, writer. That's not, not the point at all. So uh, I remember once, uh, some time ago in Australia, uh, I was uh, trying a self-organized session, just demonstrating it for uh, some teachers. And there was one child and the teacher said, you know, we will keep him aside for the moment. And I said, why? And she said, because he's got Asperger's. So I said, well, for a moment, why don't you just put him in and let's see what happens. So we put him in. And the teacher's assumption was that he would be kind of shunned by the others. You know, they'll put him aside and so on. The opposite happened. He was in demand, getting dragged from one group into another. He knew his and so, <laughs> you know, so, so then I asked, then I asked at the end of it, they did a, their usual presentation and everything. And then I said, I just wanted to ask uh, you guys one thing that I noticed that this fellow, whatever his name was, John, let's call him, you were... Uh, all calling John. Why was that? And you know what they said? They said, John can do something that we can't. So I said, what's that? He said, he just looks at a screen and he'll uh, tell you if it's right or if it's not right. And I said, what? <laughs> you know, and then I spoke to John and I said, you know, my name is Sugata. I, I, I'm a professor in England. And he said, yeah, I know all about your work. I've read your I've, I've read you. I've seen your lecture. He was about 10 years old. That's so okay. I said, well, so what did you think of my lecture? And he looked at me. Can you believe this, Jackie? He says, I know you have one favorite tie. He thought, he thought. I said, look down. I said, oh, my God, I'm never going to wear this tie again. <laughs> You're probably wearing the same one he noticed. Same one. You know the way Asperger's minds work? They, they just... You know, they're like video recorders recording stuff. Yeah, my and brother. Then, my brother's yeah. on the system. So, yeah, it's so that's easy. when I realized that there is no harm in mixing these children up when they're young. Oh, and I love it. I, I, yeah. I love, I do a summer STEM camp too, and that's a mix of kids. I would definitely, in fact, uh, this is heartbreaking. I was bringing a kid in who I always know when I meet a kid that there's a spark. There's something about the, and it, again, it's not academic. Several of my gifted kids don't even do that well at school because it's not their thing, which is fine. But this kid had a spark and I started and he caused so much problems at school. He has Tourette's, he has emotional problems. And I started bringing him into my class. And because I use like microcontrollers and things like that, he was loving it. And the kids... He, 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 he didn't have good social skills, but the kids liked having him there. Oh, I always get choked up. And then the principal said, he's not, he hasn't been identified as gifted. He can't come to your class anymore. Oh, the that, kids are that, shining. The kids I know. Shining. I know, and that is. Knew, I knew he has this little spark and he was sitting there smiling and people liked working with him and, the principal said, no, he hasn't been identified as gifted. And I, this poor kid, I just, I just, he needed to be there. And they said no, because he didn't officially test into the program. So what? So what? You know, I mean, anyway, it's, uh, I mean, we all, we know there's a long way to go to, to, to sort this out. But the only hope oh, I have, you know, <laughs> but the only hope I, I have to come faster. That's why I became, well, I, you know, I have I have good news for you, which is that even though the system is slow, but my feeling is that the network, the worldwide network, the internet, yeah. it's after the system, and it's going to break it. You know, I whether know. we want it or we, we don't, uh, we can see what's happening to the examination system because of the internet. 
the, the length to which governments are going to stop what they call cheating you know, is just absurd. In India, there was a case recently, uh, you know, universities have an entrance examination for medicine. So this was an entrance examination for joining a course on medicine in a university. They caught a student. What had that student done? He was caught for cheating. What was he doing? He had taken a Bluetooth earbud and implanted it, implanted it inside his ear. And I said, well, that guy should go to med school right now. <laughs> because, really? you know, I mean, what do you mean cheating? I mean, this guy is brilliant. <laughs> That's what he did. So, so this kind of, but this kind of thing can't go on. It's going to stop. That's when I started saying that, why don't we just let them use the internet? What the hell is wrong with doing that? I don't even believe in that. My friend is a nurse um, instructor. And I'm like, why are you having them memorize all that? All they need to do is pull out their smartphone and say, yeah, that's what, what. what's the part bone in the arm? They don't need to memorize. Both. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I mean, it's like, it's like my doctor in England. You know, I once asked her, hey, listen, uh, do you guys use Google? And she kind of looks at me and says, of course I use it 24 by 7. I have a very bad memory, she says. I look up everything. And then I said, but your students are not allowed to do that. Right. Yeah, I mean, that is strange. But anyway, it will all go. But I think it's the, the kind of work that you are doing, I think that is what will pave the way. So you have to just keep at it. Keep showing the results. Keep showing the results. Well, that's, Until... why, I, that's why I blog about everything I do with the kids. Mm -hmm. And I have a pretty good following and I teach teachers and I tell the kids, I want, it's up to you to change the world because the adults aren't doing such a good job with it. And these are, like I said, smart kids. We do empathy activities. We talk about Ukraine because they need to, a lot of people won't even do that with the kids because they think it'll disturb them. And I'm like, they know what's going on. Why wouldn't you talk about them? They want to talk about these things. And like I said, I just am amazed in awe of me. I'm really good at thinking up cool activities for them. Mm -hmm. And by the way, oh, you'll like this. So for my older students, and I, I separate them about third grade, I do think there's a developmental difference going from second to third. Piaget was right on target with that when he talked about concrete, going into concrete operations. Mm -hmm. Their brains at the end of second grade seem to switch. That's why I think some people who can't read and mm -hmm. to push kids to read at first grade, some of them aren't ready. Their brains yeah. a little bit, but then boom, second grade, all of a sudden, like one day they're reading. It's mm -hmm. pretty cool. But for my older kids, um, I have no idea where I was going with that. Well, it'll come back in a second. Yeah, but I mean, I think the what is staring us in the face is that you can leave them to their own devices, literally, <laughs> you know, oh, I and, mean uh, and and they they'll they'll find their way. That, that's the key to the the new education that we're heading towards is where, where, where you don't show them anything, they find their own way. Right. Uh, it will take us a while to, to, to understand what that means and so on. But uh, but when I look at what's happening here, you know, I'm uh, right now visiting my son in uh, San Jose, in California. And if I look at here, the, where all the biggest of the companies are and how they're hiring, they're not looking at university degrees anymore. No, they're not. Because they know that, that it's not going to be helpful to them. They are asking the kids, the, the people they hire, they're just asking them, can you do this? How would you do this? Right. And depending on the answer, they would proceed further. So it, it seems to me that our method of questioning needs to change from, you know, instead of saying, can you solve this problem? We should change that to how would you solve this right. problem? That's kind and of like what, they, I think, what was it? Google. They, there's a book of all the questions. Did you ever see that book? 
Uh, what's it called? How would you move Mount Fuji? No. Oh, look it up. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. It's the interview questions that Google uses because okay. obviously you can't Google. We talk about Google proof questions. We don't want kids to just go and find the answer because that's not teaching them anything other than yeah. something they already know. So the name of the book is How Would You Move Mount Fuji? Because it's so oh, it's a really cool question. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I will I, I will look it up. So, so what I so. do with my uh, older kids, this is what I was going to say, and this is not done enough in elementary. I, I put together about, probably about 10, it's in a blog post I wrote, electives. And they got mm -hmm. to choose which elective they wanted to take because okay. I want their uh, it should school should be interest driven too. I think I think you've talked about that too. Why make them bored? I mean, they're go going to read naturally on the internet if you give them like paper engineering was one pick. That's why they're doing and artificial intelligence, which were just started, is mm -hmm. very cool. And talk about preparing them for the future. They're learning skills that no, kids aren't getting exposed to, but they should because oh, yeah. that is turning into artificial. The world is turning into artificial. It will, it will all go. So, uh, you, you know, I, th I think we've, we, we are on the same ground and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll keep in touch and see, uh, see, see how things go. But uh, I think what we've got to do is to is to watch this new thing that's coming at us. It, as I said, it doesn't even have a name. It's it's not called education because a lot of teachers say, "Oh, that's not learning." Uh, well, I don't know what it is, but it's coming, and we can't stop I mean, it. So the world is so. There's a there was a Time article years ago, and it's still true that Whip Van Winkle woke up right. And he looks around and goes, oh, my gosh, self. I mean, he can't understand the world because it's a, but then he goes into a classroom and he says, oh, this looks like the same as when I was. <laughs> same old thing. Oh, yes. I'm so tired of it being this. I didn't <laughs> like it when I was a student. And if they had all these things when I was a K-12 student and they weren't using it, I would be questioning and I think the kids just learn to be compliant because that's what schools teach them, which is heartbreaking. They shouldn't learn to yeah. just. Well. well, you know, it's it's the old military model, the military yeah. colonial kind of model, which is where it's coming from, that everybody has to be identical. You know, so if you're above average, you've got to be pulled down. If you're right. below average, you've got to be pulled up. But you, you've all got to be average. Uh, yeah, it comes, uh, yeah, it comes from a time when when governments wanted everybody to be exactly the same and to follow orders and that kind of thing. But uh, luckily for us, that uh, that world is gone, really. And, you know, okay. so, yeah. yeah, so you and I, we're going to sort of, I think in our lifetimes, see that old world just completely disintegrate. Well, it's getting closer. And that's what, like I, my, I said years ago, and I still think it's going to happen is, Instead of us doing this, our hologram would meet in my living yeah, they would, room. Or whatever. Like or, chatting, or, like, <laughs> or it yeah. would be in, inside our eyes and so on. Yeah, I mean, yeah. al already my speakers are inside my ears. <laughs> it's, it's, so it's only a question of time before before the screen goes inside my eyes. And that's the end of the matter. When, when a guy is walking down the road, you wouldn't know where he was. I know. <laughs> I love so I read a lot of science fiction because I I I just love. Oh all. yeah, so do I. I I love it. I I love it. My latest discovery is this guy called uh, Ted Chiang. Oh, I okay. don't know who that is. He, he, look, you've got to. The name of the <laughs> the name of the book is Exhalation. You know, breathing out exhalation, yes, right? and uh, he's got a half Chinese name, so Ted Chiang. You have to read it because this, according to me, this is the future of science fiction itself. Oops. Yeah, I found them. Yeah, that's it. So, so that that's the that's the guy you should read. Well, I should 
I should be taking off now. And uh, thanks very much for, for, for you know, this unscheduled conversation. Um, I, I'm, I don't teach at the elementary school on Mondays because I teach at a couple colleges. So this was perfect. And like I said, if you ever just want to get on and just and just keep fantasizing about our future of education, I would love it. <laughs> sure, we'll we'll uh, do that for sure, and I'll watch out for more stuff uh, on your uh, FB page. Cool, cool. All right, <laughs> All right. nice meeting you. Right. Yeah, yeah. Bye, Jackie. Thank you. Bye, Thank, you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.